you're seeing tropical moisture on its way north across Texas. And if you take a closer look at this cloud field, this is cumulus spreading into stratocumulus. Let's take a look at that on the soundings. There's our surface map at the sour, a little cyclone up there near Quana. Taking a look at the sounding for that opening clip, capping inversion. So we're getting this lift through the lower part of the atmosphere up to about six or 7,000 feet, and then stratifying beneath this inversion. It's always cool when we can see some stuff on the sounding that corresponds to what we have outside. There's our surface chart for this afternoon. It has gotten a little bit busy. Surface cyclone centered around Omaha with a cold front extending down towards Wichita Falls and Midland. Warm front extending east into Illinois and Indiana. And the warm sector that's delineated by this area right here. We've got 60s and 50s dew points flowing northward, and where that intersects the triple point and the cold front, we're getting thunderstorm development taking place. Back behind the front, a vast mass of cold air. Most of this is coming in from the Pacific. You can see that up in Montana, 44, even 50 up in Alberta. That's not cold air. That's not coming from the Canadian interior. So this has pretty much taken a trajectory kind of like this. And that's that push of Pacific air coming across the Rockies. And you can see the effect of downslope. La Junta there with 62 and 70s in the Texas Panhandle. If we go a little bit further north, we get into some of the wintry weather. Snowstorm in southern Saskatchewan out towards Winnipeg. Temperatures hovering right around freezing. And some of these reports indicating heavy snow. There's one there and another up. I guess that would be Prince Albert. I don't know all those cities very well. And if you take a look further up north, that air up there is not particularly cold. Teens and 20s, but we do pick up some below freezing conditions, or I should say sub-zero conditions, right in that area there. So we're starting to see the first signs of old man winter. So not only sub-zero, but also 1032 millibar high, and during the more severe cold air outbreaks, we see 1040s and 1050s. Let's take a look out in the Pacific. Well, looks like Oregon and Washington getting hammered by another system. That's it right there, Bear Clinic uh, region, triple point. Looks like that's taken aim on Vancouver Island and Seattle. The occlusion going north of there and any of this area right here could be a potent region for further development and the presence of the atmospheric river, which we'll take a look at shortly. In Alaska, pretty quiet. We see single digits and teens, not bitterly cold, except up at this station north of Nome. So definitely cold there and along the Brooks Range, but the rest of Alaska is probably close to seasonal normals. And taking a look out in northern Canada, well, we've covered that already. That's the new strong polar system. I'm not sure if that's going to head into the U.S. or not. We'll take a look at that shortly. And then out in the Atlantic, looks like a strong compact system near Nova Scotia, but temperatures well above freezing. A smorgasbord of warnings. These brown ones are going to be for wind in the western Dakotas, northwestern Nebraska. And then we've got winter storm advisories, winter storm watches up there near Fargo, Grand Forks, and International Falls. Some severe thunderstorm watches in Kansas and Oklahoma, and a flood watch up there in the Seattle area, Portland, for the next system coming on shore. Yes, what is up with that? 
This is the integrated vapor transport. This is showing that the massive high precipitation potential is bound up with that cold front and triple point, and that's going to be heading towards the east into Washington and another slug coming into Seattle in about 48 hours. And then we get a drying trend as ridging works its way onto the coast. And there's another batch of moisture coming in for the weekend around the 14th. A quick check of the National Hurricane Center shows this disturbance well off the coast of Nova Scotia. That's going to be southeast of that one system that we looked at. That's it right there, pretty far off the map. And we're not expecting that to be a factor. That's just going to keep trucking along to the northeast. And then we're looking at pretty much a clear picture in the Atlantic Basin. However, it is busy at the Storm Prediction Center. Got two slight risks, one centered just north of Kansas City, the other around Oklahoma City, down towards northern DFW. And we can see two severe thunderstorm watch boxes out. Storm reports have been pretty sparse. Two wind reports up there north of Topeka and this other hail report around Wichita. However, I can take you right to the mesoscale models as we get that strong low-level forcing. We're going to see a linear structure start developing during the hours after dark, moving into the Fort Smith area, Springfield, down towards the DFW region. Looks like it pretty much cuts off right around there, according to the HRRR model. And that continues propagating to the east, hitting Memphis around 5 a.m., 4 to 5 a.m., and Shreveport, and maybe a little back building into the College Station and even the Austin area. So we'll be kind of a close one for the I-35 corridor. As far as severe potential, we'll take a look at the supercell composite. We do have a pretty sheared environment. I mean, we can see that on the photographs. There they are right there. You can see the hook shape to the photograph, the 0 through 1 kilometer shear vector. That's nice and rounded, 30 knots of zero through one kilometer shear and some decent pulk shear. So that, that definitely puts the SRH up there at the 200 to 300 range. Even the significant tornado parameter is elevated somewhat, pretty much right in the EF1, EF2 range. However, we can look at this little inset right here to see where the problems are. Looks like CAPE and LCL are not that great. Those are pretty much right in the marginal range. CAPE, yeah, 1,000 to 2,000, that's not very high. And LCL, well, the surface-based LCL method looks good, but the mix layer, most unstable, those are just a little bit too high. That's up at about four to 5,000 feet. This is pointing towards weak moisture return, just not enough moisture has gotten up there in time to destabilize and increase the humidity of the boundary layer in this region right here. So most of the weather is going to be dominated by strong forcing, especially after dark. That's going to, that front is going to act like a kind of a squeegee. And as a result, we'll get this linear development. Now, one other factor I wanted to look at was DK because that controls the strength of your cold pool. We can see the values are kind of low, 600, 700. So it does not look like the storms are going to be cold pool driven to a major extent. And that could possibly push the cells into a little bit more towards the discrete end of the spectrum rather than a linear squeegee squall line. So that would be another factor to keep in mind. So downburst potential, not that great. They are looking for a marginal chance of some tornadoes here and there. Some supercell modes, some of the cells will have very large hail in a tornado or two. And we're looking at the Red River for those prospects. Again, not great. The atmosphere could be better, but the potential is there. Well, it's time to take a look at the weather around your part of the country. 
Today's weather around the country is sponsored by the 2016-2021 Outlook for Wood Toilet Seats in Greater China. This is an invaluable desktop reference, only $5.95. I mean, where are you going to find this kind of information? This is great stuff here. Well, looks like a nice day across the southwestern U.S. Some indication of fast flow up there in the Great Basin region. Got those transverse bands indicating standing waves. And then around the Bakersfield area, a little bit of upslope conditions. That's going to be stratus and fog kind of pushed up against the Sierra Nevadas. Moving further up to the north, we get into the frontal zone. And we've got standing waves. Look at that right there in Nevada. They are not moving, even though the flow is coming from the northwest at 40 or 50 knots. Further out to the northwest, clouds advecting inland from that Pacific system lurking off the coast. And a nice day there in Washington. There's also some standing waves. See that right there? That's going to be Standing lenticular altocumulus around sunset, that would be a very spectacular place to see the sunset. And here comes the next system coming in from the west. And we'll take this thing off to the east. There's that rainstorm, the occluded front, and further north, the snow. Looks like that's starting to clear out through most of the Dakotas. You can see the dry air working in from the west. Down to the south, we get closer to that warm sector. Remember, that's around Omaha south, southeast, and to the east-southeast. That's it right there, feeding those storms. And there's the convective cloud tops. Those are cumulonimbus anvils, a few overshoots around the Topeka area. And as you move further to the west, you get back into the drier, cooler air on the high plains. And going on down the line... Yeah, the tail end has kind of an elevated appearance. These are not rock-hard cumulonimbus clouds. I mean, there are some overshoots like around Chanute and down towards, I guess, around Dover. And these are just not really the best anvils, but it is thunderstorm activity nonetheless. The front extending southward, elevated cumulus down along that front. The moisture is just not really in phase with the front just yet, but as that front advances, it will get into that higher theta E air mass, and we're going to start seeing some back building down the line this evening. Texas itself mostly dominated by the moisture return coming in from the Gulf. This is a lot of stratus and stratocumulus that you saw on the opening clip. A little bit of flattened stratiform structures above that. That's where the cumulus has spread out, up at about 7,000 feet. And as you go further north, looks like there are some transverse bands underneath this overcast. Well, it's getting dark in the southeastern U.S., but one interesting thing on here is the numerous contrails. So the atmosphere is getting more humid, up at about 20 to 30,000 feet, as this band of clouds approaches from the Gulf. And it's dark on the East Coast. The days are getting shorter. Probably a good time to switch over to the NT Microphysics channel. And this shows a little bit of low cloud right around here. This is great for picking up stuff that you would normally not see on the infrared imagery. The NT Microphysics Channel also showing a little bit of cloud development out around Poughkeepsie. That darker bluish shade, that's probably some altocumulus. And then the purple shades, those are going to be cirrus clouds. And you can kind of tell that from also the wind flow. The cirrus clouds moving rapidly to the east-southeast and the altocumulus patches drifting slowly to the northeast. And that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. Thanks for joining, and we'll be back on Friday. 
I want to thank Haley, our newest Patreon supporter, and KW, who increased their pledge. Hope you have a great rest of the weekend. We'll see you in a couple days. Bye-bye.